there was a terror attack in Tennessee yesterday. Four Marines were shot dead uh, after a gunman opened fire on two military facilities in Chattanooga. The shooter was also killed, uh, and three people, including a police officer, were injured. I think one of them is still fighting for their life, and the other one, I think it was the officer, just had it was shot in like the ankle and is going to make a full recovery. Mohammed Youssef Abdulaziz carried out the attacks. Uh, it lasted for about 30 minutes before he was killed, and it's unclear at this point if he shot himself or if he was shot by the police. Now, let me tell you more about uh, the motive here. Quote, Abdulaziz was a naturalized U.S. citizen and was born in Kuwait. He graduated from the University of Tennessee in 2012 with a degree in electrical engineering and had been active in MMA and sports during high school. Police reportedly arrested Abdulaziz for a DUI in April in Chattanooga. So when he was arrested, he allegedly uh, also smelled like marijuana, and he refused to take any kind of uh, drug test, and he had remnants of cocaine on his face as well. Now, he argued, uh, I was snorting caffeine. Doesn't make it much better, but I don't believe you either. I think it was cocaine. And uh, the Daily Beast really dug into his blog and took away from reading his blog that this incident in his life was a, a big turning point for him. So before this uh, run-in with police, he, ha he had a clean record. And uh, again, he you know graduated from college and seemed to fit in. But at this point, so after the run-in with police, he was unemployed, and he had no girlfriend, people around him were getting married, he wasn't, and he basically used that incident as a wake-up call to become more religious. In fact, specifically, he used that to become more of a fundamentalist. And understand that that's not me speaking, it's him. So one of his headlines on his, blo uh, on his blog was uh, Understanding Islam, the Story of the Three Blind Men. And in that post, he declared that, quote, The original disciples of the Prophet were not like priests living in monasteries. Every one of them fought jihad for the sake of Allah. Okay, that's, that's not good. If this is the stuff that you're writing and this is the stuff that you believe, and you're saying, hey, look, this incident in my, in my life... Uh, woke me up. In the Daily Beast, they point out that he viewed this as like, oh my god, I strayed away from my moral code by doing drugs and by falling into the materialistic lifestyle. And after that, he turned to a hardline interpretation and a fundamentalist interpretation of Islam, and he didn't want to stray from the actual tenets that are laid out there in the Quran and in the Hadith. So, the second post that they dug into, uh, the headline was, A Prison Called Dunya. Now, that term uh, apparently means it's used to refer to the material world. So when somebody says, a prison called Dunya, a prison called the material world, essentially, is what he's saying. Again, I don't like the direction you're going here. The material world can be a fucking beautiful place, and you should try to live as happily and productively as you can in the material world. Let me give you uh, some more specifics. Here's what he said, quote, Know that the life of this world is but amusement and diversion and adornment and boasting to one another and competition in increase of wealth and children. Like the example of a, of a rain whose resulting plant growth pleases the tillers, then it dries and you see it turned yellow, then it becomes scattered debris. What is the worldly life except the enjoyment of delusion? Brothers and sisters, don't be fooled by your desires. This life is short and bitter, and the opportunity to submit to Allah may pass you by. Take his word as your light and code, and do not let others, uh, other prisoners, whether they are so-called scholars or even your family members, divert you from the truth. If you make the intention to follow Allah's way 100% and put your desires to the side, Allah will guide you to what is right. Okay. So, uh... All this evidence was there. It was all on the blog. In fact, there's a, another heartbreaking aspect of the story. When he put the, the quote about how meaningless life is, and it's like when you plant a flower and the flower grows and the flower dies, what was the point of it existing anyway? Because it's dead now. 
when he put that up, his mom tried to, uh, I, I don't know if you can say, like, talk him down from the edge, but, like, she posted uh, some sort of picture online where it was flowers that he gave to her, and she was like, oh, my beautiful son, you know, gave me these flowers, and I want to thank him so much. And he just uh, turned away completely from the material world, turned away from his family, turned away from his friends. And again, he laid out in pretty strong detail here what his philosophy was. He's saying that worldly life, what is worldly life except the enjoyment of delusion? You have to follow Allah 100%. The, that's his words, not my words. These are his words. So what's the takeaway from this, man? Look, the only possible takeaway that we can have based on this evidence right now is that this is a clear example of somebody who is brainwashed by fundamentalist religion. They believe it 100% and they act in accordance with those beliefs. Now, again, I want to, talking specifically to people on the left here, I want to explain something to you guys. Don't lose credibility by taking a story like this and trying to make it about things that it's not about. Okay, if you want to have a conversation about the failures of U.S. foreign policy leading to more jihadists and leading to an increase in radicalization in certain places in the Middle East, we can have that conversation, and in that conversation, there are many good points to be made. I always say, I don't blame the Palestinians at all for turning to fundamentalist religion, because those are the only people that are saying, hey, we want to give you the right to self-determination, and we want to give you a state, and we want to make you more free. So we're the more militant ones, turn to us, and we'll defeat the goddamn occupiers. So when Palestinians get more radicalized, you see the roots of it, and you understand, oh, this really does stem from poverty and degradation and politics and economics and other factors like that. Same with Iran. The rise in radicalization in Iran was directly tied to U.S. foreign policy because... Um, it, the only place that the Shah was not able to spy on people as effectively was in the mosques. So people would meet in the mosques to plan a revolution because they wanted to get rid of the fucking dictator. So as a direct result of U.S. intervention and dictatorship, it led to the increase in radicalization in Iran. So those are two examples where it's perfectly clear that you could say, yeah, the problem uh, was U.S. foreign policy, or it certainly contributed to the problem of increased radicalization. With this story right here, with the evidence we have so far, that is not the case. That is not the case. The case is, you have an individual who was raised in the West, had opportunity, went to school, was in Western life, and still chose, because he was down on his luck briefly, fuck it, now I'm gonna believe wholeheartedly a fundamentalist interpretation of religion, and I will use this ideology as my vessel to do evil and to do wrong and to murder and be a terrorist. So, the, a good way of viewing this specific terrorist is... This is essentially the, the Muslim fundamentalist version of Dylan Roof. So like when we spoke about Dylan Roof, uh, what was the point I made? I said, look, this is a fun essentially he's a fundamentalist confederate, okay? Where he, where he believes in a strict literal uh, interpretation of the confederacy and of white supremacy. He's open about that. He wrote about it, <laughs> he had a manifesto, and he said, these are my beliefs, here's why I'm doing it, I want to have a new confederacy, I love Rhodesia, I love apartheid South Africa, I hate black people, these are my beliefs, this is my ideology. Now, he was an awkward loser, which pushed him in that direction, but that's the same thing with this guy. He was an awkward loser, and the ideology pushed him in the direction of doing wrong and doing terrorism. So, my, like, I'm pleading for people on the left, don't fall into the trap where you try to make this about something it's not about, because then you're going to lose, people are going to look at you like you're a crazy person. People are going to look at you like you're making excuses. People are going to look at you like, you know, you're not being honest about the roots of terrorism. And by the way, there are plenty of examples of the roots of terrorism being tied to a reaction to, to uh, bad foreign policy or to oppression and things of that nature. That exists. And when those stories come up, we talk about it. But there are also plenty of examples of the roots of terrorism not necessarily being oppression, but the roots of terrorism being any individual uh, falling in love with and becoming obsessed with a terrible interpretation and a fundamentalist interpretation of various religions. In this case, it's Islam. Like I said, we've discussed it when it comes to Christianity. We also discuss it when it comes to, again, a fundamentalist interpretation of white supremacy or believing in 
uh, you know, a new version of the Confederacy or th things of that nature. So again, we have to be uh, fair. We have to be uh, objective. We have to look at the evidence and we have to see what the evidence tells us. And in this particular case, it is quite clear. The problem is fundamentalist religion. The problem is not U.S. foreign policy. The problem is not, hey, let's blame poverty. Let's blame this. Let's blame that. Those cases do exist and they're very vast and we cover them all the time. That's not the case here. The case here is the problem uh, of people actually believing uh, a narrative and a story and a belief system that is untrue. The irony is, he's saying here, uh, you know, oh, the problem is the real world is, is delusion. Quote, what is the worldly life except the enjoyment of delusion? Wrong, 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 wrong. What you did is the enjoyment of delusion. In your mind, you said, because of my fundamentalist interpretation of religion, I know I am right to go and kill innocent people and do terrorism. You're the one that's deluded. You're the one that thinks you're going to a place where you're going to get a, a, a bunch of virgins and that, you know, you're right in your literal interpretation of religion. You're the one that's deluded. It's not delusional at all to say, hey, we should try to enjoy our life on this planet while we're here because this is... Uh, all we know for sure that there is. Maybe there's something after, but we don't know. There's no evidence for it. So the people on this earth, secular people, non-religious people, uh, moderate religious people, they're the people who are much uh, living in delusion much less than you are. You're the one who wholly embraced delusion as you accused other people of embracing delusion, which again, more irony here is, you're the one that was the most immoral as you're accusing other people, moderate religious people, uh, secular people, worldly people of being immoral. No, no, no. They were the moral ones. You were the immoral one.